Hi, I'm Christina Mittermeier, and I'm a Sony artisan of imagery. The Last Dice of Greenland is a story that I was hired uh, to do on assignment for National Geographic Pristine Seas. And the idea is that uh, in most of the Arctic, the ice now is absent in the summer months. And in some places like uh, northern Greenland, it's one of the last places where there's still some sea ice. But as the temperatures keep rising, uh, the sea ice is literally melting right down from underneath the, the feet of, of the people who live there, the Inuit hunters. And so it's just a, it's just a story uh, about, you know, where the last ice is going to be. It's a record of a place that looks a certain way today and we're about to lose it. So f for me, it was just the most amazing experience and opportunity to travel by dog sled on the sea ice with traditional Inuit hunters for about three weeks. Uh, so this image is interesting because it's late in the day as the sun is about to set and there is a lot of moisture in the air. So you see uh, behind there's a, what, what's known as a sun dog. It's a, it's a fog bow. So the moisture in the air is reflecting the, the rays of the sun and it's creating that beautiful curve. And so I wanted to catch that. And in order to expose for that, I needed to make the man become more of a silhouette. And so you're trying to reconcile two very different exposures and trying to arrive at a compromise that I think in this case uh, works. The thing about going to a place that you've never been to before is that no matter how much research you do, there's gonna be so much that you don't know. And especially when you're traveling with people that speak a different language, uh, it can be really challenging to understand. So I'd never in my life seen a sun dog, uh, uh, one of these beautiful fog arches before. But from experience in shooting sunsets elsewhere, I knew that if I wanted to expose correctly for the sky, then everything in, in the foreground was going to become a little darker. And so it's just a matter of uh, finding a compromise and then knowing that if you're shooting raw images in the post-production, you're going to be able to lift some of the shadows and bring some of the highlights down and arrive at a more pleasing exposure uh, without manipulating the image. Uh, so for photographers like myself that come from a tradition of film photography, uh, an image like this would have been impossible just 10 years ago. But the new sensors have such an incredible uh, sensitivity to light and the dynamic range is so wide that I knew that I could expose for the sun dogs, for the sky to make sure that that exposure, you know, was going to be enough to see the fog bow. And at the same time in post-production, I was going to be able to lift the shadows of the foreground to get some detail on the, on the man on the foreground. You learn as a photographer that comes from a film background that you always expose for the highlights because you, if you lose the highlights, it's impossible to bring the detail back. And it's always better to try to work with the shadows later than to lose the highlights. So especially when you, you're shooting things like rainbows or stars or you know whatever the situation is with a difficult exposure, always expose for the highlights and worry about the shadows later. Sony cameras have these incredible sensors and so the dynamic range of an image all of a sudden is amplified. And today we're able to do things that just five, six years ago were impossible. So I know that if I expose for the highlights in the background in post-production because of the Sony camera ability to, to give me this huge dynamic range, I'm able to lift the shadows without uh, bringing up the noise. And I know that I'm gonna get some detail on the shadows. And let me tell you a little bit about this photograph. So the, the dog teams, you know, they work really hard. And like I said, they're not really friendly dogs. They're not cuddly and you're not allowed to touch them very much. So in the evenings, as everybody was setting up the camp, I would go out into the sea ice where these animals were, uh, were tied up for the night and just spend time, you know, crawling on my belly very slowly, trying to get them to accept me and maybe not bite me. Uh, but they're really interesting. And one of the most fun parts of this project was just observing, you know, dog politics. Who's the alpha male? You know, how they play with each other, how they relate with each other. And I really enjoyed uh, spending time with the dogs. This is just one of a thousand dogs that were traveling with us. Uh, but you know, I, I really like the, the shades of the eyes. Uh, most often, you know, ima imagine that you have 20, 30 dogs tied together. So all the snow was, you know, covered in pee and poo. But here, you know, it just happened to be beautiful, clean eyes and the sunset in the background. So just must take it. Now, I don't know if you've ever photographed dogs, but they are constantly moving. So getting him to stand still was a little bit of a trick. Uh, so like I was saying, 
before uh, obedience is paramount uh, for these animals. And the dog musher achieves obedience by snapping the whip. I realized as we were traveling that the whip almost never touches the dogs. You know, it's often just a crack next to the dog's ear and, you know, that snaps it to attention. What happened on this day is uh, we had a dog, a dog team that was made mostly of really young animals. And so the trainer, the musher, was trying to teach them how to work together. He later explained to me that because they were young and very impulsive, some of the younger dogs started running and the more experienced dogs, they don't like to have their harnesses, you know, a, a certain way. So they just ran behind them to maintain the, the, the you know, tension on the, on the leashes. And these dogs just ran straight into, into the ocean. Um, you can imagine, you know, a sled that has several, you know, hundred pounds of gear, maybe more than a thousand pounds of gear. And the dogs are tied to it. And so as the sled started to sink with all our equipment, our food and our tents, you know, the dogs are tethered to it. And everybody that was there was more interested in getting the dogs out of the water than in rescuing the gear. And sadly, we lost one of the dogs. I mean, just a realization that life is always a very fragile thing in these remote areas. And there was somebody uh, traveling on that sled that was able to jump off at the last minute. But if he had gone in the water, then all of a sudden you have a, a crisis. And working in remote places, you have to always be mindful of the fact that there's no hospital, there's no helicopter evacuation, that you, you're basically on your own. So things like making sure that dogs are obedient really matters. You know, you, you spend so many hours just kind of hanging out, waiting for things to happen. And we were not the only ones who were, you know, just bored. The Inuit were bored too, and so they started fishing. Um, they went to the very edge of the ice and made a hole uh, on the ice and started pulling just this, this hand line. And they started pulling out fish, and this was a lot of fun to watch. And then they brought out their iPhones and they started taking pictures of the fish. And I wondered why they were doing that. So, you know, it took a little bit of back and forth understanding. But what ended up happening is they had never seen this type of fish before and they were puzzled by it. And, you know, I wonder because they live there. What ended up being the case is that these fish are European cod and their distribution is about a thousand miles further south. But because now the waters are warmer, these fish are able to travel so much further north. And, you know, they were new in this area. They'd never seen them before. So I guess, you know, things like climate change, you have to be able to make it part of your story. These fish shouldn't be there, but all of a sudden for these people, there's a new source of food. And so as things continue to change, we have to be able to tell the whole story. Uh, this is uh, Peter Aviki, and uh, he was very, very proud of his dog team because they're all whites. And so he takes a lot of time and a lot of effort in breeding his dogs to make sure that they're all the same color. And, you know, he's one of the few Inuit people that I saw really be affectionate to his animals. And he's the one that lost one of the dogs to the, to the sea ice uh, because he's training a lot of the younger teenage dogs to, to pull the team and, you know, Young dogs can be strong and impetuous, so he lost control of his dog sled. Well, I mean, for me as a photographer, I, I like the symmetrical aspects of it. I like the, the monochromatic aspects of it. Though, you know, the snow is white, his dress is white, dogs are white, the sky is white. I like that white on white uh, kind of play. And I like the tension, the action. You know, he's using his knife to make a hole in the eye so that he can tie all the dogs. And I was always uh, surprised, you know, by how much patience these guys have because all these dogs are tethered with a uh, rope. And as they walk and play around each other, they're constantly getting tangled on this string, on this rope. And just how much time the mushers spend, uh, you know, looking after their gear. I mean, this is their survival kit. Everything they need is encapsulated in the small world that's the sled and the dog team. Shooting in a place that has so much white is a challenge because your sensor will always want to expose for middle gray, for 18% gray. And so what happens is when the camera, if you're not shooting manual exposure, and I'm often shooting aperture priority, you know, this is just part of my habit to shoot aperture priority, 
then the sensor thinks that it's too bright and it will try to underexpose. And so you will end up with a whole bunch of gray images. And so what, to, what you need to do to overcome that is to use your exposure compensation to increase the exposure and make the snow look white again. And so it is something that you have to pay attention to and you have to look at your histogram to make sure that you're not underexposing and that you're not, you know, shooting off your highlights. Um, and, you know, it's just part of the discipline of shooting. You know, find your exposure and then just lose yourself creatively. But you need to understand what your histogram can do for you. Today we've talked a lot about storytelling and about the power that visuals have to actually help create a better planet. I hope that some of the ideas and tips and lessons and mistakes that I've shared with you that I've learned along my own journey inspire you to find your own authentic voice, to figure out what you're passionate about so that you can go out there and tell your own stories. There are no small stories and we need a lot of storytellers to make a better planet. So get your camera and get out there. Can't wait to see what your story is.